Hi, um, I'm Mario. I work at SUSE and I'm working on the fleet team and we do like the continuous delivery portion of Rancher and we have a GitOps operator. Yeah, my name is Juan. I work right now I work for technical marketing, but I have been consultant doing Kubernetes and Rancher implementations. And part of what we are going to, to showcase today comes from the experience of some of our customers. So let's start. This is a small agenda, but we will write go into the topic. Uh, we really didn't want to spend too much time on what is CI CD. I think nowadays everybody knows what this is just to contextualize a little bit the session. Uh, this really comes from modern uh, software development uh, methodologies and things like Agile Manifesto. So we try to develop our software and try to release often. And we try to replicate that model also for our operations where we define Git as a central state or place where we uh, hold our decided state. So we are going to talk a little bit about Containers, continuous deployment, and the GitOps model. And the main idea is that this model that is well known, I think everybody will be understanding which is this model is about. But our focus will be on the continuous delivery at a scale. And the reason behind that is uh, with uh, tools, for example, with Argo CD, Flux, we can easily implement our continuous delivery uh, strategy on top of Kubernetes. And that works pretty well. And I think it's a common pattern nowadays. But it's true that what we have in the middle in Orange, our continuous delivery stack, when we try to extend that, OK, and we are talking about tens, hundreds, even thousands of, of clusters. And on the other side, tens or hundreds of repositories, we start to realize that there are issues from, that come from that scale. And there's not only about performance, but also about security and operations. So uh, what we will do today, we introduce two customers, which are typical customers in terms of scale. And we will try to share some tips of what we did to overcome those scale challenges. First customer, the typical industrial IoT uh, customer, they are, they're a huge company with a global operation. Some of the factories are operated by them. Some other are franchises. So they don't have a full control of their IT, or how it looks like. They don't have full control of the networking of the security. But all of them should get the same application to control the automation on the local system of the factories. And they have a lot of different services on those factories. And again, one factory is completely different to the other. Only some a common set of services is defined. So if they are global, they are complex in terms of networking, they are complex in the way they target the applications to the target clusters. So uh, it's a big challenge. And the scale, in this case, is about 100, 120 clusters, which is big, but it's not that big. And our uh, other customer is the traditional telco customer. Okay, We are talking about delivering software that runs on Kubernetes on remote points of presence, like uh, internet points of presence, uh, presence 5G antennas. There, uh, the scale is huge. Okay, We are starting the project with 1,000, 1,200. But the idea was able to make this scalable to 5,000, 6,000. So it's a really big scale. It's here, uh, the software components we have to deploy are quite simple, are uh, cloud native network functions, so small chunks that you deploy on very specialized hardware. So let's say the topology and the hardware and the IT uh, landscape is quite homogeneous, but the scale is uh, really big. And also, as in many of those places, all the resources are really constrained. So we should be careful with what we deploy, okay, because they are. Uh, designed to host their uh, specific workload. So we should not add anything on top of that and makes performance a problem. This is a summary on the started point for both uh, projects that we tried to tackle them with Argo CD and Flux. Argo CD was used for the Andrastral IoT, and Flux was used for the telco, and they find some challenges. OK, so this is not a discussion about Argo CD, Flux versus whatever, OK? It's just we try to do a recap that those tools that are perfect and are really good have some challenge when you want to scale, as we said, hundreds, thousands of clusters, or hundreds of uh, source applications. 
And that's the quote we, we use. OK, so it's, again, uh, this is cool, but when we face the reality of scale, uh, we, have a, we have a real problem. In the same way in real world, sometimes our plans or our ideas, when they face reality, they, they fail. So we are just going to comment on two common architecture. If any of you have already played with Argo CD or Flags, we have this hub and spoke architecture, which is a more traditional and works pretty well, where we have central. That orange circle will be our CD continuous delivery software. It's managing a very defined set of cluster, usually less than 10, and it covers our testing, integration, whatever, and a few production environment. That works pretty well, OK? So this is the starting point, uh, and that was the starting point for our industrial customer. And when they tried to translate that to manage the factories when they started to, to find the problems. Another approach that many, many people is using, but this was discarded early on, is OK. So we don't have don't want to have a central piece, because at the, at the end of the day, that central piece may be a single point of failure. So we remove that, and we have all the downstream cluster just directly connecting to our Git repo. But we really discarded this early on. Why? Even if you have automation to deploy your CD stack on the downstream cluster, it's always a challenge. You need external automation. You need some way to synchronize that. And it also has the challenge that all your uh, managed cluster need to have access to your repos. One of the good things of having a centralized CD software is that you can isolate that. So your uh, managed cluster don't need to see the Git repos. That central piece we have in the Java spoke takes care of that. So when we started discussing about the scale, it's true that any of the continuous delivery solutions out there are able to do horizontal scaling, so why not? We can cover this case. But as we will see later on, it's not just about horizontal scaling, because if we put enough resources in our central cluster, that's perfect. It will work. But there are some other drawbacks that impact on this being really useful for them. Then we have uh, this other model that it's called delegation execution. So think about Argo CD, for example. You have your controller in a central location. And instead of having to uh, have direct access to all the cluster and have cluster admin privileges to start uh, to install all the software, you delegate that. You have the controller. The controller connects to your Git reports and all that stuff. But the actual execution is delegated downstream. That's good because you spread the load, and we know that uh, spreading the load is always it always helps with performance. So this is one of the first approaches we follow. In the specific case of Argo CD, this is not native, okay? So you need some kind of plugins or modification to be able to achieve that. So that's why it was uh, discarded early in the process. Then uh, this is a model that was, for example, pretty well in flags and was analyzed, which is, OK, we have have and spoke. And we try not only use horizontal scaling, but also we combine the concept of grouping our target systems with sharding. So at the end of the day, we specialize part of our controllers to specific sets of the cluster. This is also a good approach. And as we will see later on, as part of our recommendation to those customers, we tried to uh, offer something that was replicated or at least similar to, to this model. So those is really quick, some of the architectural limitations that were imposed by the scale. But as we said, the scale is not just about performance. It's also about security and operation. The biggest problem we have with the have and spoke model is uh, many of you may be aware is that, for example, a solution with Argo CD, if we go to the model where we don't have any delegation, we need to have cluster admin role in all of the managed cluster. That's impossible. Okay, that was even if we were discussing some of the other approach in terms of performance from a security point of view that was discarded very, very early on. It's not possible and it's not recommended. It's impossible to have hundreds of thousands of clusters where you have to open your API, be accessible from a central location, and grant uh, cluster and meet privileges to that. It's not that just it's a central point of failure in terms of performance execution. It's a huge point of failure in terms of security. 
This is uh, reduced with the other model because at some point you don't need to have cluster admin role, okay, as you delegate some of the execution. Only the component that is downstream needs actually to do that. But then there are, as I said, there are some extensions that cover that model, but some of them use uh, proprietary protocols, or I mean, it's not that you secure that in a standard traditional Kubernetes way. And on top of that, uh, remember our industrial, for example, customer that has an IT that they don't fully control. For this to work securely, you have you need to do properly firewalling in all your, your downstream locations. So that was a big challenge. At the same time, from a networking point of view, not for our telco customer because they have a really reliable and stable network, but the industrial customer has a huge challenge with many of the locations because they need to control situations like R gap, not fully R gap, but semi R gap. So there are factories you need to manage that you only call home on a regular basis, maybe once a month, once a week, just to ask for new updates. And you don't control the link. So it may happen that at some point your clusters are not available and you don't control that. So you get false positives of factories not being working and that kind of operations. That really comes from the fact that the communication in the hub spoke model that we uh, showed at the beginning is from central to downstream. So we will see later on how we really need to try to invert that communication to be able to scale. So we cover the architecture, we cover uh, networking and security, and other like two additional main tips. This is quick, okay? The project took months, okay? One of them took one year, but it's how we manage to put our application to the right clusters downstream. Okay, so it's about the targeting. Most platforms do a pretty good job doing this. For example, if we go uh, to Argo CD, you have your object that defines how you are going to take your repos and target them to the downstream clusters. So that's represented in a set of CRDs or uh, Kubernetes objects that are stored within etcd that are part of the Argo CD configuration. Even if this works OK, there's a disconnection between your repos and how uh, you should do the targeting. What we found after working with the operation teams is that this approach works better. Okay, So we leave the containers delivery software do their thing, which is mostly take care of the grouping and the membership of the clusters to the group. But we move the targeting close to the application we need to deploy. Why? Uh, because it's easier to understand just looking at the Git repo. We have having two different UI or in configuration. You have all that information in Git. So it's more GitOps friendly, and you can have a targeting syntax that it's easy to maintain and understand that as CRT. That sometimes is difficult. So that's one of the other tips that uh, we share that we learn through the processes. We try to move the rules we are going to use to target. We move them also to Git. So we are more GitOps friendly. And the last topic, obviously, is uh, this is a no-brainer. When you have a scale, we cannot be pulling and asking our Git repos for changes. I mean, this works pretty well. There's more clusters, a smaller number of repos. But at some point when we scale, this is becoming a problem. Why? Because remember through the discussion that our continuous delivery software is doing a lot of stuff, OK? So it's important that we try to remove some load from that. And obviously, for that, we strongly recommended our customer to implement a webhook system. There are many advantages for that. Main reason is that we only uh, consume resources or processing power when there is an actual change. We are also save some issues that are maybe with rail limiting on the GitHub side. Whatever thing, it's uh, the recommendation is also always to use webhooks. So, that's what we found and some of the findings we, we, we did for in those, in those uh, projects. And the final picture we recommended for both, both, for both of them, and it was similar because uh, we came up with a model that was able to work for both of them, and we use it for many other customers at Truce, is that we start, we need something that is able to do uh, powerful grouping. So we should be flexible, so we'll be able to define 
easy rules to define how our cluster group to reflect the most complex topologies possible. And that should be linked to a central okay, uh, continuous delivery software that is able to understand that and is, uh, if possible, scale horizontally and do sharding based on those rules. So we use those group to control the sharding we do. The second uh, part, and probably is one of the most important, uh, is that we should invert the, the, the sense of the traffic. So in our telco customers, we try not to install things downstream, okay, because we leave all the capacity for them. But it's true that we cannot manage to solve this problem of inverting the traffic if we don't have an agent. Okay? So the whole idea here is that that agent should be as small or as lean as possible. And it's important also because in these scenarios, the device onboarding is an important process. So that agent is usually the one that takes the process of onboarding the, the cluster as part of our continuous delivery uh, scenario. That way, uh, as we have inverted the communication, so it's downstream which is uh, pulling uh, for changes for central, also we simplify networking and firewalling. In our unreli unreliable connection, okay, uh, the central right now, if a downstream cluster doesn't pull for anything, okay, it's okay, it doesn't need to be dead or whatever. So usually that traffic is downstream, is pulling for changes from the central, and it's also pushing a status from time to time, but it supports pretty well disconnected or unreliable scenarios. As we have seen, we should combine all that with uh, webhooks, okay? So we reduce the load that we need to control what's going on on our Git repos. And uh, last but not least, to be make this fully GitHub friendly, we should keep the targeting rules in our Git repo, so the central is taking care of all reconciliation on the, all the state management. But uh, in terms of the downstream grouping, it's, it's the only thing they, that, they did. Okay, so the targeting, how we move one repo to one of the downstream clusters, is kept on Git, so it's easy to understand. So that's in a very, very, very quick week, uh, a summary of one and a half years of work with those customers. Okay, so and. What's next, really? Because you say, OK, we have talked about flags, Argo CD, but how did you do that? So I have here my colleague Mario that is going to talk about a really cool project that is called Fleet, that is the, the tooling combined with some other ones. That is the main tooling we did just to achieve this uh, scenario that we are describing. Over to you, Mario. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so this button is probably next. Right. So like 15 years ago, there was this uh, meme out there like that everything is now a computer, like your mobile phone is a computer, your watch is a computer, even your banking card is a computer that runs arbitrary applications. And nowadays, it seems like everywhere there are clusters, right? We have clusters in point of sales terminals. We have clusters in factory, not just one cluster, right? Often it's multiple clusters in cars, planes, uh, yeah, and oil rigs, right? That was a presentation at Suzucon that really surprised me. So they had a cluster on an oil rig. And on day zero, they took the, the machine, right? They, I'm borrowing their slide here. Um, they took the machine, they flew it out to the oil rig. And on, day, uh, on, the, on the next day, right, they could just... Uh, updated over satellite links, and they didn't have to pay for the helicopter to take updates to the oil rig. So um, really clusters everywhere. So how do, you, how do you manage all these clusters, right? And um, well, I, I work on Rancher, so my answer, of course, would be Rancher, because Rancher is like inherently multi-cluster. That is like the biggest thing. And if you want to uh, distribute like infrastructure components or applications, I would say like the answer is continuous delivery, because it's well, it's automated, it's fast, right? And you get feedback on what's happening. And um, yeah, GitOps is uh, taking it one step further where you have like everything, uh, I guess you know this, right? Like uh, in, in a Git repository, and then you can, for example, customize it. For example, if you're deploying monitoring, but you need different data retention policies, if you want to provision clusters, or you want to roll out your own applications. So, um, yeah, GitOps principles, everything is declarative, right? It's version because it's in Git. And um, you can pull it automatically, right? You reconcile um, continuously what's happening there. So that is done by Fleet. That is our logo here at the bottom, uh, bottom in Rancher. 
And um, Fleet has been around since 2020. Also, it's a set of uh, controllers, of operators running in Kubernetes. And um, it's also used internally by Rancher Manager. So um, uh, I think you can deploy Fleet standalone, but that is not um, supported. Right? But I mean, it's an open source project. So. Um, we have uh, QA working on around 1,000 clusters. We know of installations with uh, 3,000 clusters. I think that was not out of the box. As a software engineer, I often think like, well, 3,000 clusters, right? You just add the objects. Then you go away for a cup of coffee. You come back, and it's done. But it turns out it's more like adding 500 clusters a week, right, and tuning some settings while doing it. Uh, we have smaller installations that are like um, our customers have, right? We just do the software uh, that run like 250 clusters for cameras or something. And the two examples uh, one just gave. Um, so multi-cluster, I want to go a little bit into the architecture. Um, we have a control cluster that's running the operators, and that is the one reaching out to, with GitOps controller, reaching out to GitHub repositories. And it's... Um, and that is the part where you want to like uh, optimize the network traffic, like the polling interval and such, right? And then we have like uh, cluster groups and different namespaces, so you can sort your clusters by adding labels to them and uh, target them with applications. So that is uh, how it looks in the UI, for example. Like uh, this is how you build cluster groups. Like um, yeah, um, and we do support Helm customize. Uh, we support multiple repos, multiple branches. Um, you can switch to polling, right? Instead of, uh, you can switch to webhooks instead of doing polling. Uh, we um, kind of support dependencies, and that is Helm shard dependencies, right? If you have a Helm shard in your Git repo, we will download the dependencies. But also, like dependencies between applications that you deploy, we can uh, kind of wait for some to be ready before we deploy the next one. Um, we handle the RBAC. And um, we have like uh, the, the fleet approach is like a very simple approach where it's just pointed at a repository that has some manifests, but you can put a special file in there, which we call the fleet YAML, and that can have like uh, additional instructions on how to deploy this. So at the top here, like um, you see like the desired state that is your Git repository and the custom resource, the Git repo resource that describes it. And then we have like three components underneath it, which is the GitOps monitor that clones Git repos. And it creates like an intermediate format, which we call the bundle. Um, and we kind of need that to make it scale, right? So we, we have something in the cluster. And then we have cluster a multi-cluster manager that looks at the bundles and the targeting rules and decides like which bundle do it put to which cluster. And on the downstream here, we have like a very small agent. Um, I mean, image size doesn't really say anything about compute resources, right? But um, the, the agent basically just pulls um, these uh, targeted bundles from the control plane and then uh, uses Helm to install them. Right. That is uh, the nice thing is that we don't need any CRDs on the downstream clusters, so it's just like uh, one controller. Um, amongst the the customizations that we can do is like we can change the namespace to deploy applications into. We have values, uh, hand values that you can template. And uh, you can decide to keep some resources when removing. So for example, if you're deploying like uh, a storage provider, you might want to keep the resources uh, in place, right? So that when somebody accidentally removes it, you don't lose your physical volumes. Um, yeah, we support customize and overlays and we have drift detection. Uh, and we also have like drift correction in the agent. Right. Um, I'm talking a bit about performance now. Like uh, most of that is probably applicable to to most operators out there, right? Like we talked about polling with webhooks already. Um, so you can also configure the polling intervals. Like not everything needs to be checked every 15 seconds. Maybe it kind of depends on your use case, um, and you have to look out for controller restarts, right? Because if when controllers restart and you have like a, a thousand applications or something, they will resync those applications and basically process all these applications. And the same happens like periodically, like every twelve hours or so, you have to check if your uh, controller is still in sync with the clusters with the with the Kubernetes API state, right? So uh, a few one, few other ones here, like that. 
might sound obvious, but it's really easy to make your Git repository too big, right? Especially if you deploy something like a website. It's really easy to uh, like commit images or video files into the Git repo, and then the cloning obviously takes very long. So maybe putting assets in a different repository might improve performance. Of course, the less repos you have, um, the less outbound traffic you have to the whatever wherever your um, Git repositories live. Right? You could, for example, with Fleet, you could use one Git repo resource and then have multiple paths and the same resource, so it's only cloned once. Um, Another thing to look out for is etcd. etcd has kind of like a limit on a resource size. So um, since we like built an intermediate, like um, your charts can't be uh, as uh, like there's a limit to to, the, to their size. Um, the same is true for etcd and the maximum number of resources you can have. So um, I went ahead and I counted. So every time you register a cluster. Um, it needs around 14 resources to do it. Like there's a namespace for the for the cluster, right? So it's kind of like secure and away from other clusters. Um, there's uh, like a custom resource for the cluster. There's a bunch of RBAC for the cluster, like a service account token and stuff like that. And the same is true when you scale when you scale the amount of applications um, that you deploy. Like uh, this might take up to 13 resources again, like service accounts, RBAC rules, uh, a job to monitor the Git repos. So this can easily um, get very large. Now, what we recently implemented is the horizontal scaling. Um, we took a very simple approach where we just like install fleet with multiple controllers, can assign them to certain nodes if you like to, and then you put just labels on the resources so the controllers know what to act on. So that is a very simple pattern. Um, yeah, our drift correction works offline. Um, so all the processing is done on the downstream cluster, which is kind of like a design decision, right? Sometimes it's uh, better to do things in the control cluster. Sometimes it's better to do things um, on the edge clusters, right? Think of, of the oil rig. I think there it's a very good approach, right? Because the satellite link is so small that you don't want to do drift correction over the satellite link. Um, another thing to look out for when, you, when looking at performance is probably metrics, right? We uh, report a lot of stuff into the status of resources, but we recently added um, uh, Prometheus metrics, so you can can take a look at some dashboards to see like if uh, uh, yeah if there's like a difference. Um, it's also good to to test what's happening. Um, so we we have like um, a CLI that has like three subcommands that kind of match the the faces I showed earlier. First one kind of creates the intermediate format from a folder, right? That uh, is then converted into a bundle. Then we have another command to target, which will like prepare this bundle for a cluster or for uh, actually for a set of clusters. So you can see like what is hit, uh, what is like actually target in the live cluster environment that you have by uh, what would happen, right, if you if you um, deployed this. And then at last, we have like a deploy command that has a dry run option, so you can check the actual output. Like it's a little bit like a Helm templates uh, result. All right, I'm at the end of my slides. Um, we are going to do like scheduling next, that's on the roadmap. Um, so like if you want to deploy like only on the weekend or something, um, we are going to focus a bit more on the UX. But, uh, we, we were very focused on the GitOps part um, in the last uh, time. <laughs> uh, and um, we, are, we want to bring some of the features that are only there on the Kubernetes manifests back into, into the UI. And um, another idea that we have is to build something which we currently call OCI Ops. And the idea is to put everything into an OCI registry so that you have the container image in one place together with the Kubernetes manifest that you want to deploy and also the configuration for the deployment and the customization rules, right? So everything would be in one place. You could sign it to make it secure. Um, but then the question, of course, is like, how do you get this to the downstream clusters? Are they all using the same registry? Should we take care of that, right? Should we sync these artifacts from one registry to the other, and so on. Like all of that is like very much up to debate. But um, yeah, I think for for some workflows where you don't have different teams, where you have one pipeline that produces one artifact, right? Where it's like the same access permissions, like. Um, that the same people have the Git repo and the, the image registry credentials, then they can also use this information to create just one artifact. 
instead of having things in three places. Um, yeah, this was created without AI. And thank you, everyone. <laughs> Well done. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, three questions already. That's on Slido. So let's answer them. First one, webhooks on the air-gapped sites. Uh, yeah, because we have this intermediate format, right? The control plane is not air-gapped, so um, it will create these bundles, and um, our agents can connect back to the tunnel, to to the control plane, and then fetch the bundle from there, right? Okay. Once they are online, right? Okay. So, so they don't react on webhooks? Or... No, not directly. They don't. Okay. Uh, they don't. Um, they're kind of isolated. They only speak to the control plane. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then they wake up. Awesome. Next one, uh, it's about the intermediate bundle, if they are signed and uh, the data format they use. Right. Um, um, we basically, we take the manifests directly, and then we, we look if we have to compress them, and then we put them in a resource, which is why we have a size limit. Um, we are discussing signing. We want to do that, um, especially because we now have like an experimental feature to store these things outside of the cluster, right? Because like storing things in etcd, etcd is not a great data store, right? So we want to store them in an OCI registry outside of the cluster, but then like access becomes a problem. We can't rely on Kubernetes ABEC anymore. So we, we uh, when we make this feature unexperimental, I think we want to have signing. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And the last question was about uh, OCI registries, but I think you answered it already. Like, uh, yeah, the bundle is going to be in the OCI registry. Yeah, that is, I think, the, the experimental feature I talked mm -hmm. about, if I understand it correctly. Yeah. Yes. All right. If there are no more questions, I thank you very much for this informative talk. And uh, yep. Thank you. Thank you.